All right. So have you ever been under pressure? So pressured that you couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, sweating, kind of like how I feel now. But it's not time to eat or time to sleep yet, but I am kind of hungry. See, there are many people who are walking around with a lot of pressure, you know, and not to minimize it, okay? You know, people ask, how are you doing? Hello, how are you doing, right? Well, in this day and age, how are you doing is really not a question. It's a greeting. It's an extension of hello, right? They don't really care how you're doing. It's just a matter of, hi, how are you doing? Because when they say, how are you doing, they're walking away. They're not really waiting for your response, right? I mean, this happened to us. I do it. I've been guilty of doing it. So I really try to connect when I really want to know, which is rare, how you're doing. So a lot of people are walking around with pressure. And, you know, it creates health problems, right? When, when it's not released, it can cause heart problems, ulcers, migraine, right? I mean, it's not good for our health, but there are pressures. See, life definitely knows how to apply pressure. And there are certain things in life that we have to go through. And I don't know if you've heard the term, no pressure, no diamond. It's coined by Thomas Carlyle. I love quotes, and I wish I can remember half of them, right? No pressure, no diamond. And in this case, pressure is meaning adversity, right? Adversity and diamond is the desirable outcome from the pressure that you endure. So no pressure, no diamond. And it's true. You know, the diamond, before it becomes a diamond, it starts out as an ugly coal, right, that has to go through a very um, hot, you know, high heat process, pressure before it can shine into a lustrous diamond. And the same thing with us. See, pressure will reveal who you are. But before we get into that, pressure also has caused a lot of divorces, right? People has committed suicide. They've taken their lives because of pressure. They couldn't bear it. They couldn't take it, and they found no way out. You know, in the Great Depression and even the recess, not recess, recession, um, not too long ago, you know, people couldn't handle the pressure that they were jumping off the buildings because they couldn't handle the fact that they're broke now again or they're not millionaires anymore, right? Pressure can cause you to do some stupid and foolish things, but also pressure can reveal how great you are if you don't buckle down. Right. Amen? See, we have pressure all around us, right? We have air pressure, water pressure, blood pressure. <laughs> we have pressure everywhere. We carry pressure whether we care to admit or whether we know and realize it or not. So pressure is something that we cannot escape in life. You know, pressure will be there no matter how you strive to be better. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't discriminate. You know, we will go through tremendous pressure, and nobody knows that better than Jesus, than Paul, than all the other great men and women in the Bible in, in the past. And even in the, in the centuries past, you know, they have gone through tremendous pressure, and a lot of them thrived. And we'll see how that came about and how that works, how that looks like. Right now in this world that we live in, it doesn't even help now that we live in a very fast-paced society. What's next? You know, instant gratification. It's microwave. Everything is right away, drive-through. Nobody wants to wait, right? 
I'm first. I'm always first. I want everything about me. But you know, studying this, well, actually, not just this, but growing up in this ministry and, and staying in the Word, learning the Word, hearing the Word, after all, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, I realize that I'm not that important. It's not about me. It's not remotely about me. So nobody really cares what I'm going through, the kind of pressure I'm under. No one really cares. I mean, they might feel sorry for me for a little bit, you know, but in reality, when you start moaning and groaning and talking about your, your woes and your complaints, no one really gives a hoot. I mean, but there is one that does, okay? There is one that does care about you, but even God cares more about your character than your comfort. And we have to remember that. There's a lot of us who don't want to suffer, who want to evade and, and, and just run away from pain and suffering, discomfort and inconvenience. We don't want to feel that hardship, the testing, the trial. But you know what? Do you want to go to somebody who hasn't experienced life? I mean, would you want to talk to somebody to get advice from someone who hasn't experienced anything, who hasn't been through anything? How can they even inspire you? How can they even encourage you when their life has been bed of roses, peaches and cream? You know, how many here have seen Rocky? I just thought about that. We cannot be friends if you do not like Rocky. Okay? I mean, even if you've only seen one of the Rocky movies, you know, he had no quit in him. He was a poor wannabe boxer, and he was pretty good, but, you know, he, it's not a matter of him being down. It's the matter of him getting back up in the race, pressing on under pressure. And this is what the message is about, if you haven't guessed yet. It's being under pressure, and how do we thrive under pressure. We have different pressures in life, right? Peer pressure, social pressure, financial pressure, professional, career, educational pressure, relational pressure, marriage and family pressure, and then there are the teenager pressure. You know, it's, it's, you have pressures all the way around you. And no wonder why we feel rushed, you know, we feel like we have to do this, that, and the other, and we forget the most important part, which is to sit at the feet of Jesus and wait. Because when we're feeling under pressure, we feel like we want to do it on our own. We want to make it. We want to we take, God, you're not moving fast enough. Come on, I'm feeling the pressure. I've got I've to do something about it. And he says, okay, he'll let you. But then, see, I also realized that trials are just that, you know. Shift happens. Life shows up. Crisis come. Okay, those are the trials in life. It's not about, oh, I just got out, right? Although there are those kinds of trials, too. Then the testing. Testing comes, it's not always from the devil, okay? Right. Testing comes from God. He tests you so that you can trust him. Testing is necessary for our growth. And then the temptation. The temptation is never from God. It's from the enemy. And that's why that scripture, you know, I've, I, I have asked about this, and then I've heard a message that just, you know, it, it, it bore witness to my spirit that, you know how the scripture is saying that God will not give you more than what you can bear? He wasn't really talking about the testing. 
He's talking about the temptation, that he will not allow you to get tempted beyond the point that you cannot come back to him. Okay, so in every aspect of our life, there is pressure. That's why there is road rage, right? People are pressured. They're late for a meeting, and they're late for a whatever, an interview. They're late for school. They're late for church. Or they don't care. They can just stroll around and, and just, you know, cruise on by. But they are pressured. They're hurried. They feel like they've got to be here, there, and everywhere. And so the pressure just keeps getting greater. But you know what I found out to work? Because I, be, I can stress myself out. You may not see it, but those who are close to me can and do. But I realize that the greater pressure I feel, the louder I praise. Amen. I turn my pressure into praise because there is something that has to come out. That pressure has to be released. And when I lift up my hands and say, I praise you, God, because of who you are, something happens. Something breaks. I get a breakthrough, and I thank him for that. See, we have to remember that God sees and hears us all the time. Before we get to that next trial, before we get to the na- that next test, he's already there. He's already there. He's already seen the script. He's just waiting for you to call on him and say, God, you know, I'm casting this burden. It's too heavy for me to carry. And he says, I didn't ask you to carry it. I'm telling you to endure, not to carry it. You need to cast that burden on me. You see, if your situation is ever going to change, you've got to put your praise on it. If you are expecting your morning to turn into morning, you've got to put a praise on it. If you are expecting that breakthrough, you've got to put a praise on it. You've got to have that spirit of expectancy to release that pressure. Amen. The more, the heavy, the heavier your pressure is, the harder and the louder you should praise. Right now, this is pressure. Singing up here can be you know, a lot of pressure. Can't hear yourself. You're hitting the wrong key. You're getting distracted with the wrong whatever. Okay? And I'm delivering a message that I'm like excited about. And I see people that may be yawning and disinterested, looking cross eyed and, you know, uh, falling asleep or not caring. And I thought that this was a great message, Lord, because I'm speaking to me. And so the pressure is on. The pressure is on that people are looking at me and saying, what is she talking about? Or, that's nothing new. I've heard that before. So the pressure is real. The struggle is also real. Amen. But do I care? Not really, because I'll live. You know, I know that I know that I'm called to do this, and I just need to study, to show myself approved, Unto God, not unto men, and the rest is up to him, right? I just need to be a willing vessel, amen? The pressures of life should compel us to praise God with more passion. We must look to God in the midst of the pressure. You know that song that you never change? In the midst of the storm, I will run to the one who can save me, who can heal me, the brokenness of my soul. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. Amen? Because it's proven to be true. You see, when God enables me to be bolted and not moved and stay on, to stay, to stay on my, in my post, then he can do his work through me. And he will get the glory. Because sometimes we don't know how he's going to move on our behalf. But I just expect him to move. And like the Hebrew boys, the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, O king, 
I know that our God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not worship your gods, your false gods, because we are committed to the one true God. That was pressure, man. They were going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. But see how God moved mightily on their behalf? Because they did not care. You know, Paul knows that a man that is pressed will either die in his faith or die for his faith. He knows that. He knows that pressure is on. You know, the book of Acts, I'm getting excitable and I feel like I'm out of breath. The book of Acts was written by the good old Dr. Luke. And, you know, he was the author, so he recorded what he has heard and seen. He's reporting the accounts of what happened back then, the miracles, right, the healing, the flogging, the beating, the persecution, triumph and trials. But he made it seem like because we are performers in life, you know, nobody really knows how we feel because we perform. They know how we are. They know how we work. They know how we perform in life. So he makes it look so easy, right? I mean, he made it look so easy that, you know, Paul got bit by a snake, a venomous snake, and he just shook it off. No poison, no fever, no sickness, right? He was beaten by bandits. He was flogged and left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He was forced to fast. He was hungry, naked, and cold, imprisoned, shackled, chained, right? He made it sound so easy. But if we can go to 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. Hallelujah. This is where we see Paul being so vulnerable. He's talking about his feelings, his experience, how he was. 2 Corinthians 11, 23. Is that the amplified version? Are they servants of Christ, the Messiah? I am talking like one beside himself, but I am more with far more extensive and abundant labors, with far more imprisonments, beaten with countless stripes and frequently at the point of death. Five times I received from the hands of the Jews 40 lashes all but one. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been aboard a ship wrecked at sea. A whole night and a day I have spent adrift on the deep. Many times on journeys exposed to perils from rivers, perils from bandits, perils from my own nation, perils from the Gentiles, perils in the city. Perils in the desert places, perils in the sea, perils from those posing as believers, but destitute of Christian knowledge and piety. In toil and hardship, watching often through sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, frequently driven to fasting by want, in cold and exposure and lack of clothing. Paul is giving an account of what he's gone through, the kind of pressure that he's gone through. He is saying, this is real. This is something that I experienced. This is something that almost cost me my life. This is something that I am living in and living for. I am under extreme pressure I don't know when the next attack will come. It's coming from all over me, from all around me. Yet in the book of Acts, we're saying, wow, the miracles, you know, the, the power, the, the healing and, and all of the great wonders, the works that God was doing through them. But have you considered the price of what they have gone through, of what they've experienced the price of following Jesus under pressure. 
Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. We sing this in Trading My Sorrows. You know, he says he is pressed on every side. He is pressed on every side, which means there is no, no nearby exit. There's no way out. He is pressed from the left, right, front, and back. No relief, no release. I am pressed, but he says, I am pressed, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Amen. How does he say this? How does he get to say these things? It's because he says it in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. He knows who he is. In the book of Acts, by the ninth chapter, he's getting converted. Saul from Tarsus becomes Paul. Right? This is what cost him. He experienced the mighty hand of God, and he's never the same. You know, invariably in church, negativity or negativism comes from those who are living close to the enemy camp. They're never involved in the Lord's work, but they are the loudest to criticize, to condemn, to point out what's wrong, to tell you that you're not measuring up. But they're not doing anything, yet they're sitting there judging, condemning. That's pressure from within, right? How do you handle that? You know, at work, you know, managers or executives hire good, loyal people. I mean, you don't know that, and that's why you do a series of interviews and you hope that you get the best, right? But you can fire them if they don't perform up to par. You know, gang members, they are big in perverted loyalty. But, you know, pastors, they got to love us, whether we're good, bad, or stupid. They have no other choice but love us. They can't fire us, right? So the pressure that the pastors have are great. Have you considered that? Yet we minimize what they go through because we see that, you know, he's, after all, a, you know, a, a, a big guy that won't take crap from anybody, Right? And when he says he's blessed, you see it in the fruit of his work. You see the labor that's happening, the discipleship. So, yes, how are you doing today? It is well with my soul. I am blessed. I probably can count, you know, people in one hand that I will believe that response from. You know, there are some people hiding from the pressure. And they think that they can hide that from God. How are you doing? Real good. I'm real good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. But you know they're not. They're heck of lying. You know? I mean, let's be real here. I'm not asking you to talk about your dirty laundry and talk about your woes and blues and all that. But, you know, I'm sure you have one confidant, a friend, or somebody, somebody who you can ask, pray with me, I'm struggling with this. Pray for me, I'm struggling with this. But no, it's always, oh, I'm real good. But you're out of fellowship, okay? You're never around in any of the events, function, right? But you're blessed and you're really good. I don't understand that. But you know, if I sound like Pastor Mike, I'm not going to apologize. It's because I'm being discipled by him. And I am not ashamed to say that because it's bearing witness with me in the word of God. If God is saying what he's saying, then I can vouch for it and say it is good and it is well with my soul despite the storms that I may be facing. Pressure is real. Pressure, I've been under pressure. I've been under pressure. I was here and I'm not tooting my own horn, but I was able to 
crawl up in here when my son was in the hospital in, a, in an unconscious state for a week. I was here when my mom passed away. She was already gone. And nobody, some of the people didn't even know. But I was here. Why? Because I needed to worship harder. I needed to praise God even more because that is my way of escape. God makes a way when there seems to be no way. He is the burden bearer. He is the one who loves my soul. He is the one who lifts my head. He is the one who releases the pressure because I know that I have a greater promise in him. Amen. So it doesn't matter what that slight or small affliction that I may be under. I know that I know that I know that my Redeemer lives and He cares about me. Hallelujah. If that does not excite you, I don't know what will. Because God is the lover of our soul and He cares so very deeply about us. He wants us to rise above. He wants us to rise above. You know, He wants us to tell Him, God, I am feeling the pressure, like Job. Oh, my God, Job, I don't ever want to go through what he's gone through. But he was tried and true. He, even at the end, in the end, when he experienced losses after losses and was covered in boils from top to bottom of his body, he was found steadfast in his integrity and commitment to God. What about, you know, pressure will reveal the depth of your character. Gideon, you know, in his estimation, he may have felt inadequate, disadvantaged, and insecure, but pressure would reveal that he was a mighty man of valor. King Saul might have appeared tall and handsome in all of Israel, but pressure would reveal that he was a dwarf at heart. Right. Amen. King David, 17-year-old shepherd boy. You know, pressure would reveal that he was a man after God's own heart. Pressure, pressure will show your true colors. What's inside of you is what is being measured that's coming out, like how you're responding will, will, will show what your future will be. It will show how you will be, how your life will pan out. Are you someone that is committed to the cause? Are you someone that will finish till the end? Or are you a beginner but a quitter? You begin all the time. You begin again and again, but you never finish. That's pressure. Talk about pressure. You know what? We also put unnecessary and undue pressure upon us by comparison, through comparison. You cannot compare yourself with anyone else, but only by the word, the mirror of the word. Are you living up to the word of God? You know, are you in faith? See, testing in life will show us our true character. Have you ever wondered how fish are able to, you know, handle the pressure in depths of water that our human capacity, our human body will not be able to and will explode? It's because they're able to function because there is that internal pressure in them that is equal to the external pressure around them. So they're able to survive in that pressure that we won't ever be able to. I remember, or I read this story, you know, studying this pressure. Pressure, you know, when your life feels like it's a pressure cooker, there were fishermen from northeast, and, and you know they're shipping their fishes across the country, and they were having trouble selling the fish because by the time the fish gets there, it's flavorless. 
you know, because they're dead, right? And so they're frozen, and by the time they receive the fish, they can't really sell or eat them. Then they found a way to uh, ship them live. But then by the time they get to the marketplace, they're alive, but they're still mushy, and they're still no good. So after countless trials of, you know, like trial and error, they finally found one that works. They added catfish to the containers. So naturally, codfish and catfish are enemies, right? Are enemies. So the fishes, the codfish, it's the codfish, are swimming for their lives. So by the time they reach across the nation, they were fresh because the pressure kept them better. Amen. There are some pressures in life or adversities in life that are needed because otherwise we will never have the result of the desired outcome that we're looking for if we did not go through that pressure, that adversity, that hardship, that testing, that trial. Amen. I mean, you know, when I lost my job about 10 years ago, that was pressure. It was pressure that was inexplicable because, I mean, you know, as, as a woman with kids, with bills, right, rent, and the things that I like to buy and food that I like to eat, I mean, you know, I'm thinking about these things, but for a moment, I did not allow those thoughts, those thought bombs to bombard me with fear. I said, you know what, God? There is nothing I can do. I didn't have sleepless nights. I didn't have migraines, and I did not have ulcer. Why? Because I said, you know, God, you know my heart. You know the God-given abilities that you've given me. I'm trusting you, and so you are in control. You've got something better for me. And you know what? He did. Amen. He did. And I had to stand there and believe it and act like it's true. I believed it. I saw the end when I proclaimed it. I expected it. You know, I may have been under pressure, but I didn't let you see me sweat. Amen. Because otherwise, I would have negated what I was confessing about my God. I would have negated what I was confessing about what I believed. So we have to remember that God is always watching. You are never alone. He is watching over you, and he is always on the move. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So do you know Bruce Bochy? I don't until today. He's a San Francisco Giants manager, right? Another quote. I love this quote, one of many. He said, if you're unprepared, it's not pressure you feel, it's fear. Amen. That is so true. Okay? When you're unprepared for an exam, right, you're unprepared for that pop quiz, that test that your teacher didn't tell you he was or she was going to give. You're like, you're not. Yeah, you are feeling the pressure, but really you're fearful because you know that you're going to bomb the test, right? Because you didn't study. So whose fault is that? You're not ready. Audits, you know, oh my gosh, I'm stressing over audits at work because things change all the time. And then the communication, anyway, because somebody might be watching live. So anyway, audits are, you know, I better be, I better chill, you know? Because audits are, you know, it's like unannounced. Why? I thought it's not punitive, but, you know, that's pressure. And, and I'm like looking and making sure that all the files and binders and logs are up to par. And, you know, I'm feeling the pressure because, you know, managing a, a, a place is ultimately, you know, all on you. The responsibility. It doesn't matter when it's good, it's everybody. When it's bad, it's you. Right? That's how it goes. 
Amen. So the pressure is real. But you know what? I just said, you know, I'm going to do the best I can. Just like Esther, the pressure, when she heard what Mordecai had told her, she said, if I perish, I perish. That was a lot of pressure because the Jews were going to be annihilated, right? And Mordecai was telling her, do you think you're going to be safe in the palace when you get found out that you're a Jew? There's a plan, there's a decree to wipe out all the Jews. So she took a risk. That was a lot of pressure because she was not invited in the court of the king. And they know that it's a perilous thing to go uninvited if he does not extend that golden scepter off with your head. But he, she had favor. She had a favor. She risked her life and the Jewish nation was spared. Amen. See, how do we respond to pressure? We don't like pressure. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, I didn't like, I don't like pressure, you know. Even when it feels when it's a good pressure, like acupressure, acupuncture, you know. It's like chiropractic, physical therapy. When you're hurting, when something is hurt in your body and they start applying pressure for your good, right, it's like, ow, 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 ow. Okay, but the end result is good in the, in the end. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to Psalm 119, 11. This is, I believe, how David was able to encourage himself. It's that weapon inside of him. Your word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against you. Amen. He knew that pressure would come, but he has the word of God in his heart, hidden in his heart. You know, what comes out of you, right, is far more important than what goes into you. Amen. Pressure will reveal the direction of our course. Pressure will also reveal the truth of our commitment. Amen. Those who excel under pressure are those whose minds are already made up long before the disaster, catastrophe, or crisis arrives. They are ready. They're, they've made up their mind. They have burned bridges where there is no retreat. No backing up, backing off, or backing down. It's showdown. It's showtime. It's like I am going to show up and I will not be moved. Amen. Those are the people who rise up because there's no quit in them. That's the worst thing that we can ever do is to quit short of our destiny. Amen. We don't want to be quitters because God didn't quit on us. Jesus in Gethsemane, that was pressed. And you know what Gethsemane means, right? Olive press. He was pressed beyond measure that when he started to pray, he started to sweat blood. Probably broken capillaries. I don't know what was happening. I don't know biologically anatomically, physiologically, what was happening, but it was recorded that he was sweating blood. He was so under pressure, the sin of the world, the weight of the world, the pressure of crucifixion, being separated from the Father. That was a lot of pressure in Gethsemane, but he snapped out of it. He says, not my will, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Okay? He remembered. He remembered that he had to go through what he had to go through. He had to endure till the end for our sake that we take for granted. We take the grace of God, his salvation, for granted because we're spoiled people. 
who don't want to be uncomfortable, who don't want to be inconvenienced. It's my time to go to bed. What are you doing calling me? I need to take a nap. I'm not going to answer this call. My eyes are tired. I'm not going to read anymore. We can party all night, but we can't pray up all night. See, it's, it's selfish. That's why we have a lot of selfies, right? We like to hear about juicy gossip. Gossip. But we don't want to put our bodies under, like our mouth, our tongue, to be bridled, to be disciplined. You know, because after all, the peer pressure is so great. You want to be funny. You want to be, you, wanna be um, you know, like that superstar when you're telling those jokes because it's funny to be funny. It's fun to be funny at the expense of others, right? You, you feel the pressure. But, you know, like the apostle said, I or we would rather obey God than men. Can we say that? Do we, do we remember that? You know, we have such great examples. There's another quote. I don't know if I have it. But it's Martin Luther King Jr. You know, he says, the ultimate way of measuring a man is not where he stands in the midst of, of, uh, of convenience, and it's another C, convenience and something, but rather where he stands in challenges and controversy. That is so profound because you know what? About, what, 57 years ago, he marched for freedom without violence, and he died for what he believed in. He preached the word of God, and he lived by it. So I can listen to someone like that because I see results. I see progress. I see faith in action, right? I see him being under pressure but not bucking down. Hallelujah. I don't read Greek or Hebrew, but I read this word. Say it with me, hupo meno. Hupo meno. It's an original Greek word, which is pretty consistent with what is, what has been translated. You know, the Bible or the books, different books, say it as a perseverance, endurance, patience. But hupo meno is a compound word comprising of two parts. Hupo means under. And meno means remain. So it's the idea of remaining under, staying put, not wiggling away from the pressure of life. Hupo meno. It's enduring. It's being patient. It's being steadfast. God intends for your trials to transform your conduct and character. Amen. Amen. You know, when I feel like I'm going to get out of character and get into the flesh, when I'm stepping away from the fruit of the Spirit, when I'm not going to be in my regenerated spirit, I get reminded because, God, we're talking about anger. And now I'm talking about pressure. God must really be dealing with me. So pray for me when I am on fire about a topic. That means he's speaking to me first. And there's got to be something done. I have to do something about it in cooperation with God, not by my own strength, because I can't do it. But with him, I can do all things. Amen? Let's go to James 1. 3 through 4. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This one, it says, you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Again, the worst decisions that you could ever make in life are quitter decisions. No matter how hard it is, do not give up. Do not quit. Do not stop going. Only move forward. Don't go back. There's nothing, there's nothing back there. You go forward. Don't quit. Hallelujah. God enabled you to stay. He is the anchor of your soul. One last quote by Nelson Mandela. There is no passion to be found in playing small, in settling for a life that is less than the one you're capable of living. Amen. Did you get anything at all tonight? Hallelujah. If so, let's give God a praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Amen.